Well, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, uh, I'm all of a sudden uh, greater than I'm really quick. Good job. And I've got to do my part. I've got about four of you left. So uh, unless I get covered up uh, this afternoon, you can get your first one more class by then. You all seem to be doing it pretty well. So that's good. Um, okay. So let me give you a uh, presentation here. Well, they can be uh, any pair of subgroups uh, of G, maybe the same. And I think that notation is suggestive enough. The things in HK is just crap of the form little h, little k, where h comes out here, k comes out here. Now, let me point out the dangerous bend here. This is a set, it's just a collection of objects. Let me point out that this set, of course, contains the subgroup H. It also contains the subgroup K because you can take the identity on either side. But nobody said that this is closed under multiplication or anything like that. And in fact, it's going to be kind of interesting uh, when this, this is the case, right? When it is uh, a group itself. But for now, it's just a set. And it's an important subset of the group, so we want to be able to count this. So, here's a theorem. Um, I'm not assuming that G is finite, but I am assuming that H and K are finite subjects of G. Then what would you guess at this, right? How many elements are there in H K? You know, if I was a naive fellow, which sometimes I am, I would be tempted to say that, right? The number of things that I can make H be, the number of things I can make K be. Um, but what could go wrong? This could definitely be an overcount. Everybody agree with that? Uh, in fact, let me give you a silly instance where this is an overcount. If H and K are the same thing, if they're both H, then H, K is just H, and this will just have however many else H has got in it, and this will have the square of that. All right, so I don't expect this to be exactly right. How do I fix it? I divide out by the overlap. Now, the question is, is why is that a hard thing to do? So, Just for convenience of notation, I'm going to like let L be the intersection of H and K. This is a subgroup of K. Uh, it's a subgroup, of course, both H and K. And since H and K are finite, then L is finite, right? So we're okay with that. And uh, the index of The index of L K is this. Equal to N. So that's just a, a notation we're going to use. Uh, and let me point out that this is. The order of K over uh, okay, because remember from all that business we were doing with drawings, this is really just the number of left or right cosets of this thing in this, which is the quotient of the order. The quotient of the order is one that's finite, and both of these pieces are finite. So we can write. Uh, 
uh, I'm going I'm to partition K into these cosets. Um, These uh, LKIs are this one. So let's break that up. That way, of course, uh, K is the union of those disjoint cosets. Uh, and let me also notice that. <laughs> and the key is, is because I was a subgroup of H, right? And so everything in L can be distributed to element of H, and so this is all still going to take that. This is going to be important in our little counting we're going to do here. Uh, so we can write HK. So with this, uh, with this in mind, we can write HK as the disjoint union Um, okay, well, I get why K is the disjoint union because basically we define this to be uh, of index N zero by 50 coset. Why is, for example, oh, and I also get, I also get that this makes up all of HK, that the union of this should be all of HK, right? Because A general element of HK looks like little h little k, right? So if you take little h little k, this element of k lives in one of these cosets, right? So I can write I can write k as L uh, times some k i. Everybody agree with that? But L is also an H. So every HK lives in one of these, right? So what I've shown here really is that is that HK is subsumed by that union. The next question is, why is this not too much, right? I mean, it occurs to me that uh, even though those cosets are disjoint over there, they may not be disjoint. H I H J where I times J. Well, let's suppose it is. So there is this H H prime H. And what does this mean? Well, let me do a little mathematical custard education here. Uh, so I get H inverse H prime equals K I K J inverse. So how does that help? There's something important. These two elements are the same, right? That's what the equality means. This means 
These are both in H, so that they're both in K. Well, and so that means that KI and KJ represent the same subset modulo L. So I So now that we've uh, totally got that taken care of, let's let me let me go back to the statement here, which is that HK is this disjoint union. That means since this is a disjoint union, then all I have to do is count this up. So this is the sum. Uh, All the same size as H. All right, because all these all these uh, cosets are the same size as the size of H, which is N size of H. But N, if you remember, was um, K over. Um, Okay, any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to give you another proposition. Uh, this one I'm going to leave as an exercise and then a final theorem for the section, and then we'll start talking a little bit more about normality. But any any questions so far? You might see if you can uh, pound your way through this one here. Um, let's suppose H cairns uh, subgroups of G. Then. Uh, what we have is the index of H intersects K in H. No more than the index of K and G. Uh, This works even if the index is infinite. Well, in the special case that um, the index of G is finite, then In the special case that the index of K and G is finite, then you get an equality instead of just uh, inequality, if and only if G is HK. So for this one, see if you can count some, count some process to see if you can get that comparison. Let me give you a theorem that will, well, at least for the part of this, we use this. Theorem 3 1 0. And uh, 
H and K are subgroups of finite indexes. Okay, so in particular, this applies to any G that's finite. Right, because if you have a finite group G, then all its subgroups have to be a finite index. But this is more general, right? Because if you look at, for example, the integers, right? The integers is certainly an infinite group, but any non identity subgroup has finite index, right? Z mod NZ is a finite index. So, uh, so this applies in a more general situation with these finite groups. And This thing is finite. So if you have two uh, subgroups of finite index, its intersection can't get too small, right? I mean, even if G is an infinite group, if these have finite index, the intersection, which is a smaller group, still must be a finite index. And Uh, um, um, by the way, <clears throat> this statement right here, G B, uh, this statement of G, uh, the index of H intersection. K and G being finite follows from this, right? Because this is finite, this is finite. Um, and equality holds. It can only work. G is H -K. So, conclusion is similar to the proposition here. Um, So basically, this proof shows why the previous proposition is kind of important. Uh, G uh, is equal to right. notice that that's. Uh, always true, right? G intermediate group, intermediate group all the way down. That's, that's always true, independent of uh, the assumptions here. We don't need the assumptions for that. And this is less than or equal to And of course, that follows. It's good. Right? Because this thing is greater than or equal to this thing. And of course, now you've got that inequality problem, so you know that this is finite. Uh, and the equality follows as well from the previous proposition because. Get equality here, it can only have G equals HK. And that equality is exactly what you need for the equality here, since G colon H is uh, uh, the same on both sides. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> Subgroups so of homomorphisms are incredibly important when you're studying groups. Uh, I think it's pretty natural if you want to study an algebraic structure of groups to so, say, you know what, I want, I want to study this VA subgroup, right? That's the subgroup space. I think it was kind of a true uh, stroke of brilliance to recognize that normal subgroups 
are sort of the important things. And actually, it's what you need for there to be a certain homomorphism that's well defined. We'll get to that later. But a normal subgroup, there are special subgroups that are incredibly important. There are three, two, one. So I'm going to do the definition because you all know what normal is. Students experience. And then Well, suppose you have a subgroup N of G, uh, the following are equivalent. Uh, number one, uh, right and left equivalence, right and left N uh, coincide. That is, if you look at the equivalence classes under right, uh, uh, right equivalence modulo n, it's the same equivalence class as this left uh, uh, equivalence modulo. Two, uh, Edward. So three A N equals N A for all A and B. Uh, that's I mean on the surface of it, that looks like a slightly stronger statement, uh, but of course it's equivalent. Uh, or for all A and B, uh, A inverse in A and N. But if when you conjugate, remember what I mean by this, just for clarity here, this is the set of A inverse in A as in rings to all N. So this is a set, it's a collection. So if that set is contained in the set in, then you're good. And five for all A and G, uh, A inverse in A. Uh, and we say that any subgroup satisfying one against all of these conditions is normal. We say N and we will write the symbols. It's a little like subgroups, and you just close like that off into a triangle. Yes, isn't that also equivalent that every normal subgroup is just the kernel of momentum? That is correct. Right, yeah, uh, it's, it's normal. No, in fact, it's a kernel of a particular kind of work. And one might argue that that's where the whole notion of normality came from because you can make a normal subgroup a kernel of a homomorphism, uh, which is the homomorphism from G to G by the end, but you can't do that. Uh, if, in fact, you can do that if and only if uh, the group is normal. So let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, we have uh, conditions in these sketch. I don't want to promise if I'm not going to deliver all the same sightings here. Anything obvious here?
So I'm going to do this. I see another one there. How about, I think five implies four. We can all work that from nine. Um, so one and two are equivalent, so I'll put them together. Uh, five certainly implies four. Um, how about uh, how about the relation? How about every uh, left coset of n is also a right coset of n? Uh, well. Three implies two, a certain trick. Uh, one case of two implies three. Well, But A and be an arbitrary left coset. Right? All I know from the statement of two is it's a right coset. So there exists B and G such that A N can be right. But note. Notice that A is in NA as well. It's also in NB. And what do we know about two cosets? They're either disjoint or they're exactly alike. So NB is in A. So A N is in B. Now we've got that. Um, uh, let, let, let's all note also that I think we can get three and plus five, right? A and A. Um, So I'll let you do this computation. Uh, I'm thinking fast and loose about multiplying on the left here by a invert, but I mean, if you just compare the sets now, look at this, and you can go. And I will, let's see it. So that gives me three implied five. Uh, and so all we need is four plus three, and I'll leave that as an exercise. I always thought this is interesting because lots of fancy alpha books they, they introduce it this way, but actually, um, the equality you get the equality for free, so you might investigate and see if you can uh, get that. Okay, questions so far. Okay, now this is time. We'll do some examples. Examples are very important. Let me start off with um, an observation that I think is what can you say? About the subgroups, all of them are normal, right? Uh, by the way, let me let me point out sort of a workaday thing here. 
then if normal in G, it can only have uh, G inverse in G is in N for all N perfect. For all G in G, uh, N in N. So every conjugate of an element by N by something in D still is an N. So, any subgroup of If you've got a billion here, then any conjugate is just the element itself. Right? A is a billion, every subgroup's normal. Let me also point out. I mean, I know this is kind of dorky, but um, any group has sort of two canonical normal subgroups. The identity is normal, and the whole group is normal in itself. So I think it's, this is just by closure in the group, and this is because, well, E commutes is different, right? Let me generalize that observation. Uh, I think I've used this notation, but let me remind you this is the center of G. That's uh, NG, such that CG, CG, all G. The center of G is normal. Again, this comes from this observation here. And the observation I could make is this. To make this work, right, to, to get this to leave in alone, I don't really need G to be a billion. I just need to crap an M to meet with everything. And so actually, the center is normal. And I can generalize that to say any subgroup of the center is normal. Uh, oh, this one's like totally sexy. Oh, I like this one. Four. Uh, here's a couple of limitations. This is the set. Um, This is called conjugate or subgroup. And it is generated by all commutators. Uh, well, let me give you how many of you, I'm curious, how many of you have seen commutators in your in your travels? It depends on your course, perhaps, but I'm putting this way, so when you see the square brackets, x, y, that means a commutator, and it is just this. Let me point out um, why do they call this a commutator? It seems like kind of a random thing to call it. Well, let me point out that. This is the importance of it. A commutator is trivial if and only if the two elements that you're taking the commutator of commute. Right? So if they commute, you get a trivial commutator, and if you get a trivial commutator, you get a commute. And that's the commutator language there. So um, what is the commutator subgroup? Take your favorite group and then put a little lockbox over here. Take every possible commutator. 
and that'll give you some elements of the group, and then take them over here and see what they generate. Maybe it generates a whole group by, or maybe not. So, for example, if G is an abelian group, what's every commutator going to look like? Since G is abelian, every single commutator will be the identity. So the only thing you put over here in the lock box is the identity, and it will generate the identity. So, but in general, if you've got a group that's not abelian, this tends to generate some anxiety stuff called commutator subgroup. The commutator subgroup is generated by the group is always normal. And we'll see uh, some of this before it's later. Let me point out one last thing before I move on to the next example. The commutator subgroup is generated by the commutators. That does not mean everything in the commutator subgroup is a commutator, right? In general, what you expect to have in the commutator subgroup are products of commutators, which may not be a commutator. Products of commutators in your inverses, but it turns out that the inverse of the commutator is a commutator. Because the inverse of this is y inverse x inverse y x, which is also a commutator. Okay, any questions on that? And uh, here is actually perhaps the most important part of my little example section here. I'm going to verify this. Uh, if F is a homomorphism, then the kernel of F is a normal subgroup. This is, this is a big one. In fact, I shouldn't call this an example. It's a little basic theorem here. If you want to find a normal subgroup, it has, or uh, uh, then you can look for a kernel of a homomorphism. And in fact, it works the other way, as was pointed out earlier. If you have um, a normal subgroup, it is the kernel of some homomorphism <coughs> with domain G. Uh, let me let me prove this. So let G be in and X be in the kernel of F. What does it mean for X to be in the kernel of F? So F of X is the identity of H. Now, inverse. Here's my favorite commutator of X. I need to show that this new blob is still in the kernel. But this is a homomorphism. And actually, I'm not even going to do homomorphism. The important thing here is in the, in the middle, I get the identity for H. All right? So this is actually F of G inverse F G. Inverse or G inverse G, which is F of E, which is E H. So this thing is in the kernel. So it's a normal subgroup. And like I said, the importance of this example is in a certain sense, every normal subgroup of the group can be construed as the kernel of a homomorphism. So if you understand this one, you, in theory, you understand them all. Uh, that means here's kind of a here's kind of a little factoid that we may run across again. So the commutator, so if all this blah 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 copy that I've been actually is true, that means since the commutator is normal, the commutator subgroup is normal, then that must mean it's the kernel of some homomorphism. Right? It turns out here's another way to find the commutator subgroup. It is the largest subgroup of any group G, such that when you take a home uh, when you mod out by it, it's an abelian group. So it is the, um, it, it, it's the, it's actually sort of the smallest subgroup so that you get a homomorphic image of this abelian. So like I said, we'll see uh, some of those connections later. Uh, here's 
Here's a stronger OH and G be separate. Such that sigma of H is contained in H uh, for all sigma and By the way, you might so so what this what what's this all about? Well, you have a couple things that can happen. Suppose you apply an automorphism from G to G. What it, what this uh, what this subgroup has the property of is um, it takes anything in H and H. This may or may not happen with some subgroups. Right, it is possible to see that maybe this copy of H gets moved over here. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe every automorphism takes H into H. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples of such a subgroup the group itself and the identity subgroup. Right? If you have such a subgroup, uh, Called a characteristic subgroup. And H is characteristic. And some numbers are like H or That's always the case. See if you can verify that because basically, to be normal, you only have to be fixed by certain types of automorphisms. Uh, let me point out the convergence of truth. You can, it, it's possible to have normal subgroups that may not be characteristic for certain groups. Uh, here's a last kind of specific example. AN, the alternating group um, M letters is normal in SN. And uh, if I take DN, the back group, the group generated by rotate flip. Where you see an SRS on inverse, then the subgroup generated by R. So, in other words, the subgroup you get by just rotating the, the uh, endon is, is normal. Uh, any questions? I guess that's. Uh, I just mean that it's got this property that any automorphism uh, puts everything in H somewhere inside H. Yes. The six follows from the fact that the inner automorphism are mapping to the automorphism. That is exactly right. That's exactly. That's exactly. Um, definition. And after this definition, we'll do a quick classification. Uh, you say the simple if it's only normal subgroups. Uh, we know that E and G are automatically normal subgroups. Well, what if they're the only ones? 
This is what we call um, a simple group. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. We'll get, we'll actually prove this later. A n is simple. Uh, for n equals uh, one, two, uh, three, and well, how about this? Not equal to four. There we go. Much better. It turns out that the alternating with one in letters uh, is simple, less than Um, let me ask you something here. What does a simple abelian group look like? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yes. That is exactly right, right? Because if you're abelian, every subgroup has to be normal. If you're simple, those can be the only normal. So, so basically, you're saying you've only got two subgroups, right? And so we haven't gotten to Cauchy's theorem yet, but basically speaking, what you need is a group that only has two subgroups, the whole thing in the identity. And actually, those, those groups are either the identity, which is silly, or uh, the groups for it's more exotic, of course, for uh, groups that are of uh, higher order that are more uh, sophisticated prime factorization than these prime. Okay. So let me uh, let me leave you with this thing to think about. Theorem three, two, four. Uh, let K and N be subgroups of G with uh, N normal. And it's normal in G. Uh, a. N intersect A is normal in K. Uh, N is normal and N join K. And let me uh let me tell you what I mean by this. This is smallest subgroup of G containing basically containing all of N and all of K. So take a shovel, dump everything in the end and everything you pay in this big pot and see the subgroup that it mix, mixes up, right? It's the intersection of all subgroups of G that contain both of these. And that's what that is. Uh, in K, K M. Uh, you need N to be normal for this. This is very important. Well, actually, you need something a little bit weaker than normal, but normal will do. But you, you do need a condition like this. Uh, and then, if K is normal in G as well, so let's just suppose that K is also normal, and K intersect N is the identity. And this is actually a very important case that will come up uh, when we look at direct products. Then in K equals K in all K in K in N. This is kind of an interesting situation here. So if both K and N are normal and their overlap is the identity, then Kn is in K for every K and K in and N. Let me point out this does not mean the group is billion. This does not mean that, uh, that, that uh, the G is billion because the individual elements of K may not commute with any, each other. The individual elements of N may not commute with each other. However, when an N and a K are next to each other, they can do that. So 
Think about this uh, for next time. Any questions? This is actually fun for the sequel. Quite exciting. Any, uh, any questions? Okay, well, you all have a good one. I should have your homework back, I hope, by this afternoon. Uh, if you got any questions, I'll be in my office. Let me know if y'all have a good day. Questions out there? Yeah. Any other questions?